All right. Thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for coming to our uh, November 1st, 2023 Northampton Urban Forestry Street Commission meeting. Um, I would like to acknowledge uh, a few guests that we have. Uh, we First of all, we have uh, Gabby uh, Immerman, who's going to give us, uh, hi, Gabby, welcome, who's going to give us uh, a really cool presentation um, on the uh, 150th anniversary of the, uh, for the uh, uh, Mill, uh, Mill River flood. And um, what she's been working on. So I'm, I'm excited to hear about that since uh, I, I last met. I'm sure she has a few updates, but um, I'm happy she's here to share everything that's going on with us. Uh, also, uh, we have a couple members of the public. There's Devorah Levy. Uh, Devorah, if you have anything you would like to add to the meeting, the public comment is now. If you not, you just say hello. Nice to see you again. Um, and of course, Jackie Balance. Jackie, you probably you gotta yeah unmute yourself, please. Yes, uh, I sent y'all an email a couple of days ago about uh, trying to lobby for peaceful coexistence of solar and trees. And I, if you had a chance to read it, I'd appreciate hearing any feedback because I'd help work on it if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. and uh, and and Kent, welcome, Kent. You are you're you're a member of the public, but a little more than a member of the public. But you, if you you feel free to uh, join in any time. We we're pretty relaxed in our rules here. As long as there's no fighting, we're fine. So, um, which typically uh, tree people don't seem to have that problem. I I've noticed that they don't typically. Well, at least in my experience, but <clears throat> anyways. Um, I, I all have right. a question for public comment. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious if anybody is interested in or knows about uh, Miyawaki Forests, which is a way of um, creating an, in, an intense, small forested plot um, that's supposed to grow very quickly. They seem to be sort of taking hold of it in Cambridge. They're doing their third one now. And I'm not sure if it really is that applicable to Northampton because we have a lot of forest, but it, it's a way of um, creating a, a grove um, a fairly, fairly quickly. They seem to, even in a couple of years, have significant growth. So um, I could send out some information to the commission if you're interested or um, just not not sure if it's on anybody's radar or not. You know, it was just on my radar this weekend. I was talking to Rob Postal, who's from Cambridge, and he said that he he was asking me if I saw some information on the Cambridge project. And he said that um, one of our visitors and a former, I think he was a former commissioner, seems to be very involved with it. I'm spacing his name help rich the tree person from cambridge we met. oh Dave, uh, uh andrew, andrew, putnam. andrew putnam yes he said and it seems like andrew putnam's very involved in that maybe he could talk to us about it sometime yeah they they did a fairly good sized one the first one at danahee park it was probably i mean fairly good size might be a hundred feet it's a circle and it, it's not that, and it just sort of plopped down in a park. And I don't forget where the second one was. And now they're just doing a third one that's on a private property. I think it's in someone's front lawn, actually. So I think it's really small. And um, how do you spell it, Ken? It's M Mia M I W A. I'm no sorry M I Y A W A K I. It's somebody's name, a Japanese botanist. Who came up with the idea? And you know, if you just Google Miyawaki Forest, you'll find information about it. I know there was an article, I think in the Globe not too long ago, about the original one in Cambridge. Um, so could, you, could you spell that again? M I Y A W A K I Miyawaki. I remember seeing pictures of just like itty bitty, itty bitty little spots with a forest growing. Yes, they're small um, and they, they start out small. They plant saplings. It's very intense. So they it's 
they plant a lot of saplings close together, which they compete with each other and makes them grow. And then I guess the healthy ones keep going. And it's supposed to be a way of fairly quickly establishing a small, hmm. a small woodland, really. Thanks, Kent. You're welcome. Hold on. Okay. We back. We back on there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I, even though Northampton is, yes, uh, more forested than some of the other communities in the Commonwealth, <laughs> I think we're, um, we'd are we be very interested in looking into that. Um, because I think originally, uh, David Lukens, who can correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the things that we were trying to uh, put together as part of the drafting of the new significant tree ordinance was uh, planting trees uh, and woody plant material in groves. And actually uh, promoting that um, as a way to uh, to basically have those uh, carbon sinks in uh, urban heat island, especially in the urban heat island areas of the city. Um, yeah. So I think I think it would be really it'd be really interesting. The other thing too is that there's a lot of obviously there are some studies out there about the um, um, about the, the the concept of trees actually living in a grove and actually communicating with each other and communicating with the soil and how that all kind of plays into um the little uh um the um the, the microclimates that they create and the habitat that they support so yeah definitely thank you all right i'll send out some links so see if i can dig up that recent article especially okay great Th thank you uh i see jordan's thank you jordan made it all right great to see you okay um i did uh any other public comment okay perfect um the minutes from the uh october 4th did folks have a chance to read them no okay well all right um, well if Molly, whoever did not have a chance to review them, if you have a chance to review them, that would be great. And then let us know when you're finished and can, someone can make a motion to accept them or amend them. <clears throat> Done. I think we're waiting for everyone. Is okay. All right. Is, um, <clears throat> can uh, we may have someone make a motion to accept the minutes as presented or amended if they so choose to? Molly's making the motion. Okay. Do we have a, a second? No, I second it. Okay. Rich Parrish. Uh, any discussion on the motion? No discussion. Bonnie, would you mind doing a roll? 
Rich Persoletti? Uh, yes. Susan? Yes. Molly? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. David? Yes. Richard Parrish? Yes. And Jordan? Well, Jordan, Jordan's there, but I don't. Jordan is there, yes. Yes. Driving, I believe. Uh, driving, yeah. Mm. And is muted. Okay, well, we have. Jordan, can you hear us? No, having technical difficulties. Okay. All right. Well, we can, I think, well, the motion passes. Um, so we can just leave that Jordan uh, checkbox blank for the moment. Okay. All right. Thank um, okay. Thank you. Um, moving along. So chair report, tree warden report. So last, uh, at our last meeting, I had told me had exact date. And let me go back and look so I can October's been a pretty busy month. That's the fifth September, October. You're gonna have to pardon me. Public shade hearing was the tenth of October. Um at Park Hill Road. Um, there were no objections, and those th that was only for two very small trees. There was a three-inch uh, red oak, northern red oak, and an inch and a half. I don't remember an inch and a half, uh, inch and a half cherry, maybe. So there were no objections to the uh, to the removals. Um, the mitigation is roughly around seven hundred dollars for both trees. Uh, mm -hmm. The applicant has agreed to pay the mitigation and also pay uh, or, or plant some trees on the site after the construction. We have to work that out, um, but they're going to be paying for the removal and they're also paying for the advertisement in the Daily Hampshire Gazette. So there has been no um, there's been no um, no issues with that. Uh, the other public shade tree hearing that we had last May, which you recall, in Leeds, which was in regards to a uh, utility uh, upgrade, utility line upgrade for national grid. Oh, yeah. That public shade tree hearing happened. And there were no objections. However, that project has still yet to be permitted. Um, city and national grid, I believe, or the permit hasn't been approved by the city um, because national grid, there's been some delays because they have to actually apply for uh, permits from Conscom in order to remove all the trees along that uh, ridge line because of their uh, proximity to the Mill River. So that still hasn't yet. Um, I will keep you posted. But as far as our end of the public shade tree hearings, we are we don't have to do it again. Um, um, the other thing that I wanted to mention to you, just a quick update um, about Main Street for everyone. So. I've been having uh, uh, some correspondence with um, Stephanie Weir, who is um, one of the chiefs, uh, the one of the principal um, landscape architects that's working for tool design, who is contracted by the city. Um, and we've had some back back and forth about some of the trees that are sort of the first churches, the, the old Heritage NIS Bank, which is now Urban Outfitters, I believe. So there's potentially, uh, there was some interest in potentially making a water feature um, in that area somewhere next to where that is. It's not sure exactly what type of water feature, um, but they asked me to go back out and assess the health of those four trees, which are, four, those four trees are um, slated to remain um, as part of this new project that's going to be happening in 25 or 26 um and, and um i just reported back to her that the trees the uh, elm trees in particular in front of first churches are in i would say fair condition um the soils there are really compacted um because of the amount of traffic that happens uh, the pedestrian traffic that happens so they will i will i'm going to work with uh, a local contractor to to mare spading uh, and some root invigoration um 
there um, and some fertilization and probably in the spring. But um, I'm not exactly sure what the water feature is going to look like, and but it's I don't believe it's going to be impacting. Um, I don't believe it's going to impact those trees at this point because of their condition. The other thing that I uh, was made aware of is that the there the city council uh, will have to do um, an acceptance of Main Street. So there apparently is no formal acceptance of Main Street that they could find. Um, at the registry of deeds or through any other um, documentation over the years, because Main Street is probably the, one of the oldest streets in the city dating from the 1600s. So in order for MassDOT, uh, which is standard operating procedure, in order for them to um, proceed with the project and provide us with the, the funding and all the design work, they have to have proof of ownership or proof of acceptance. So that will be another um, public process, um, similar to the ones that we had to go through about eight years ago, when there was multiple private ways the city had to accept that we we thought were city right of ways. Mm -hmm. You're frozen, Rich. For accept. So that'll be another. Process that we'll have to certainly. Um, can you hear now? That no. So so, huh? Most of the time we can hear you, but then you cut out, cut in and out. Like that last little part, we didn't get too much of. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So there will be a public process similar to the ones that we have done in the past where there'll have to be an acceptance, public hearings. So it should be, it will be interesting given the amount of uh, conversation that we've all seen uh, by letters to the editor in the Daily Hampshire Gazette about the Main Street redesign, et cetera. Um, the other thing is, is that um, we, we may have to have as part of the public process through MassDOT, there might have to be um, a public shade tree hearing for the trees that are going to be removed. And it's not a typical public shade tree hearing. It would be, it goes through the MEPA process where there's public commentary allowed about the removal of the trees. It doesn't necessarily prevent the trees from being removed. I've ever gone through the process, so I'm not familiar with it. So that will also be um, potentially a, another um, place where we may, you know, I, I'll probably be called uh, upon public comment potentially, or maybe some of us. I don't, I don't know any of that, but I just wanted to make you aware of it. So, um, so then I will quickly tell you, uh, and I don't have, I should schedule a little more time, but um, I was gone for that one week. I was in Washington, D.C. at the World Forum on Urban Forestry. Um, there were a thousand people at this conference. Uh, it was attended. Uh, there was a representation from 60 countries uh, and every continent except Antarctica. So it was absolutely amazing. I'm still trying to wrap my head around um, everything that I was uh, exposed to. Um, but I, what I would have to say, there were the presentations were very interesting. They had two keynote speakers today. They had presentations that lasted 12 minutes each in a one and a half hour time block. Where they had representatives uh, from different countries that were uh, either urban foresters uh people in the, in the industry uh phd students uh full professors from everywhere um talking about their particular uh urban forestry program um their particular business um we had representatives from the biden administration there talking about the inflation reduction act um it, it was phenomenal i i have a a, a short list of things that I want to share with you in an email, like different websites to look out. And, um, but I just haven't really had a chance to like stop running since I came back. So once I have a couple minutes to breathe, I will put that all together and send it to you so you can get out. But it really, um, really going to these conferences, this one in particular has really made me my look outside of the box. There are so many people in the world that are trying to do the same thing that we are trying to do and they and they are successful and they were there to tell us 
how their program was successful and what they did well and what they didn't do well. Um, and out of scientific information about the programs and especially in particular the European Union, which um, comes from comes to the urban forestry world and community urban forestry world from very scientific background. So something that I am not exposed to, um, you know, like in the Commonwealth, um, but we're fortunate in the Commonwealth because we have a solid program here, thanks to uh, um, Department of Conservation and Recreation uh, and uh, other foresters, urban foresters and tree wardens and professionals like yourself that have come before us. So, um, so it was just really interesting. I could go on, for, I could spend a whole hour and a half talking about it, but I'm not gonna do that because that would be unfair to everyone and especially Gabby. Nope. Yeah. We'll break out there, Rich. I hear what has to say. That was that was Yeah, I know. Hold on a second. Oh, I'm I'm done. Okay. I'm 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 done. So we can move on unless someone has questions. But I think we'll yield the floor if no one has questions to Gabby so we can hear about uh this awesome project. Just one, one quick little thing. It's not a question, but I would love to hear more about a lot of the insights that you got. And I wonder if there's maybe people from the public who might like to, I don't know if you would like could give a presentation or something about some of the key takeaways. I think a lot of people might be interested in that. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm interested in, I'm still trying to like, I, they had QR codes for everything. So luckily I had my phone with me. So I was able to take pictures of everything and I was able to actually hook to all these websites. So there is definitely a lot to, there is a lot to talk about. Um, and there's so much uh, urban forestry training available um, either through, uh, uh, you know, universities, uh, they have programs for people, uh, workforce development, um, you know, comprehensive training for volunteers. I mean, it's, it's everywhere realize how this how big this movement really is until you go somewhere where there's a whole bunch of other people from 60 countries that are trying to accomplish that's the same thing that we're trying to accomplish i'd be more than happy to share let me let me put everything together i'll send it to you and then we can have a conversation about what you think would be helpful um thank you so that'd be thank great you. Yeah. gabby you're up all right <laughs> Hi, y'all. Thanks so much, Rich. Really appreciate it. Um, you guys, uh, I know some of you already, and uh, I'm wearing a lot of hats. And so I think I'll just start by explaining that um, if you're like, where have I seen this Gabby person before? Um, I've worked at the Smith Botanic Garden for over 20 years. I teach botany and horticulture there. Um, Jen and I have shared a few students over the years. Um, and uh, I also am a very civically engaged person. I'm uh, one of the uh, founding parents of Grow Food Northampton Community Farm out in Florence. And I am also on the board of the Hilltown Land Trust. I live out in Williamsburg. And so I'm involved with land conservation in that direction. And then the hat that I'm wearing to speak with you all today is as one of the conveners of the Mill River Greenway Initiative. Um, and um, some of you, I'm sure, know my uh, my adopted father, John Sinton, who is uh, the visionary and founding parent of the Mill River Greenway Initiative. And I'm kind of a the son of son of John as far as um, uh, carrying on those legacies. He's still involved, but also um, pushing ninety and ready to ready to bequeath it to the next generation. So I'm here on behalf of with John and, and all our partners in the Mill River Greenway Initiative. Um, so I, I brought a few things to show and tell. Um, I'm, I'm really specifically here to tell you about a tree project, but I just wanna start with a 30,000 foot. And I'm gonna share screen just to show you um, a couple of things. And then I emailed everybody one document, but also anything else that I've got here that anybody else wants to see, I'm more than happy to share um, at the end of the presentation. 
So first of all, I just want to show you that, um, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen right now, that uh, the Mill River Greenway Committee has a beautiful website. Here, I'm gonna reload it so you can see how our cute um, website populates when you first open it. So this is millrivergreenway.org. And um, it's a kind of a landing page for this community initiative. Um, the Mill River Greenway Initiative is um, in part a movement to create a shared use path, but we've always conceived of that much more broadly as kind of an intention of giving the Mill River back to the communities that live along it. Um, it's, uh, as you all know, Northampton and Bay State and Leeds and Florence and Williamsburg and Skinnerville, all of these villages were founded based on growing up around mills, you know, um, water powered industry, um, going back to colonial sediment. The, if you don't know, the first dam on the Mill River was uh, at Smith College and that's in the, what would become Smith College and that was in the 1660s. So um, this is why it was named the Mill River and it's really responsible for um, the location and the raison d'etre of all these little towns. And then all these towns have kind of in some ways forgotten that they're river towns um, because the industries have moved on. Um, and so the Greenway Initiative is just really interested in giving the river back to the communities and in any number of ways. And we involved with educational initiatives and um, invasive plant uh, remediation and mapping projects and we're involved with we do lots of work with the local colleges and then a lot of this work organizes around the creation uh, the intended creation of a shared use path following the course of the Mill River from Northampton to Williamsburg so um, interestingly in Williamsburg the project is further along um, and that, that's in part, and I, I guess Rich, you'll appreciate this, because we don't have a robust city government, we have like two and a half employees um, in our town administration, and we don't have a planning department um, or a tree warden or anything like that. There's actually room for a group of organized local citizens to really advance a project. And so um, in, in, uh, in Williamsburg, let's see, so I'm going to switch over to here. In Williamsburg, we're, uh, we're much farther along and actually uh, planning, um, gaining consensus, planning for, and, and now we're almost in the phase of implementing this greenway. So um, you guys can see these maps that I've got up now. Okay, so the map on the right here is an ortho map showing you the course of the greenway in Williamsburg and the dotted line there, that's just route nine. It's going to follow along on Route 9. Um, this map here on the left is gives you a little bit broader, but it, the reason you don't see the Greenway all dotted line out through Northampton is that in Northampton, it's a gleam in our eye. Um, it doesn't exist uh, per se, and that's because a project like this would need to be um, um, adopted and championed by the planning office and the other city agencies and so we can serve as an advocacy group but we're not in the same position to actually advance it so our intention as a greenway initiative is to kind of get this thing built in williamsburg and then i will switch my attention to um, continuing to advocate educate get community input and ideally uh, implement a similar project in uh in northampton um, I wanted to show you that uh, in, so here's just an example. Again, this is out in Bergie and I appreciate this isn't your, um, you know, your charge, but just to give you an idea. So if, if anybody's familiar with this curve, if you drive out to Williamsburg, this is the part where you can't, we have to get off your bike because <laughs> uh, you could die, you could die biking around this curve. We call this the pinch. So this is the current um, condition right here. And this is what the Greenway will look like. Um, and we're actually probably within five years at this point, we're hoping to have this exist. Um, and just to make it even cooler, this is actually what the path looks like. This is a cross section to show you that the path is actually cantilevered out over the river in this section. So we don't interfere with the rivers uh, footprint and or or implicate the river at all. There'll be some armoring of the bank there to prevent further scour. But this is how you get a, um, a an extra ten feet of width 
going around that corner without implementing, you know, without um, negatively imp influencing the river is by hanging, we're hanging the bike path off of the, off the roadbed there. So it's, this is all a really exciting project. And there's, I, I literally have a 60 slide deck about Williamsburg, but you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to show you that. I just wanted to give you a little taste. So this is what I'm really here to talk to you about. Um, here's where we pivot into the tree adjacent part of my talk today. Um, so uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Great Mill River flood of 1874. And um, although it may feel like yesterday, it's actually we're coming around on the 150th anniversary of this tragic event, um, which will be May 16th next year, 2024. So there's a group of us that are planning for a series of commemorative events that relate to um, resurfacing this um, really formative, important story in our community's history, and also using it as an opportunity to educate and is maybe activate our communities around flood resilience and river health because these issues are so freshly relevant. Um, I don't know if you all know, we lost a bridge in Williamsburg in, uh, in July and the big floods in July. So in addition to all the impacts that happened in Northampton, one of the two bridges in Haydenville is now closed because the abutments got scoured out in those enormous floods of um, roughly July 10th. So these, although, although this, the, the 1874 flood was a, um, a human made, um, I guess in a way they're all human made, but this was, an, this was an industrial accident. In fact, at the time it was the largest industrial accident in American history, um, soon to be superseded by much larger industrial accidents. But um, uh, you know, the, the floods now that come from these enormous rain events that we're having as a result of climate change, um, the issues around the Mill River and, and flood safety and flood resilience are, are very relevant today. So, um, in particular, so we, we're planning for a, a series of commemorative events and um, maybe just to note a date, um, May 16th, 2024 is a Thursday. So we are planning a, a commemorative day on May 18th. Um, the, that's the Saturday immediately afterwards. So on that date um, in Williamsburg, there'll be um, a, a, a cluster of events which will include um, a reenactment um, of the ride of the, um, what's his name? George Cheney is the, uh, was the, the person who was managing the dam up in Williamsburg and saw the dam giving way and then took a, um, a frenzied ride down the course of the Mill River and is credited with saving many lives. So there's gonna be a reenactment of George Cheney riding down Ashfield Road to a North Street in Williamsburg to give a warning. Um, there'll be a commemorative service at the Williamsburg Church. We're hoping to have exhibits at the Meekins Library and historic, Williamsburg Historical Society at that time. There'll be some tabling from local organizations like Hilltown Land Trust um, around kind of present day um, surface water management and land conservation opportunities and all those things about sort of how can you get involved now and what are the, what are the ways in which this story is relevant to you today. And then um, we're also going to be creating a self-guided interpretive tour um, that follows the length of the flood, which is Williamsburg into downtown Northampton, that's going to have about 75 um, historic markers. We're going to be erecting signs with historic photos and this banner. And then um, actually, let's see, um, I just put in... Oh, I know it. Okay, sorry. Forgive me. It's it's on a different. We're going to create a brochure. Um, if you can see this, follow the flood. Um, and then, so this is a mock-up right now, but all these red dots are going to be locations where there's a physical marker um, out in, in the towns. And um, you can either access this online, a virtual exhibit, or you can drive along and see photographs like this that are going to be posted in the locations of the present day, so to re resurface the history. Um, and then, um, so this is just another example. And then finally, now I'm, I'm coming around to the part that's um, relevant to you all, which is the um, 
memorial tree planting. So this is the document that I've just emailed to you. I appreciate that the font here is too small for you all to read it in this presentation, but this flyer has been, I just sent it to you all. And this kind of gives the context for the part that I wanted to share with you today, which is that the part of this project that the Greenway Initiative is gonna lead up is that we are hoping to convene, raise funds for, and then implement over the next five years, the planting of an, a commemorative urban forest consisting of 139 trees to be planted in the path of the flood, each of which would be planted in memoriam to one of the victims um, that lost their lives in the flood. So on the one hand, we create a living memorial to the folks who died. And um, I'm, I'm sh it's, it's very affecting to know that many of the folks who died were families. So um, we have all that information working with Betty Sharp who wrote the book uh, In the Shadow of the Dam. And so we know that um, this family of five lost their lives in Skinnerville and this, this group of people lost their lives in Leeds. We know where everybody lived and all the names of the folks who died in the flood. And so our intention would be to dedicate the trees as appropriate in the locations of the towns they lived in or the factories that they were working in when they lost their lives. Um, and so this is where you all come in because the um, this urban forest would take place in the path of the flood. And if you can see on this, this map on the left here, and again, you have this in your inbox, so you can zoom in after my presentation, the blue lines on this map are the the approximated extent of the flood. And we've got this map all the way from Upper Williamsburg where the flood began down through Leeds and Florence. It, it incorporates the growth, what's now the Grow Food Northampton Community Farm is where most of the flood spread out and slowed down. But the water from the flood came all the way through Northampton through the channel of the Mill River and ultimately out into the Connecticut. So the intention would be to site and in, install 139 trees path of the flood, um, again, in association as much as possible with the individuals who lost their lives. So this is really what I wanted to share with you guys. There's not anything immediate um, needing to be done. Um, I am planning to do a lot of private fundraising um, to furnish these trees so that, for example, if folks that are on private property would like to host a tree, there's no need for these to all be, for example, street trees. Up here in Williamsburg, we're gonna be building this greenway. It's two miles of a green belt. That's gonna be a wonderful opportunity to furnish trees all along the green belt of the new greenway. We're also, just built a new public safety complex um, at the intersection of Route 9 and South Street. That's a new green space. Uh, we, we hope to, um, you know, revitalize that as a, as a green space that can host some of these trees. So we'll, we'll be able to provide sites um, for many public infrastructure projects in Williamsburg. And then we'd be really, we're just really excited to work with you all and work with Rich and the, um, you know, the, the planning and implementation of the urban forest in Leeds, Florence and Northampton for any trees that are either planned anyway or that we could enhance the presence of the urban forest within the floods footprint. Um, we'd love to work with you all either to provide those trees or in cases where you're planning for trees anyway, maybe sweep those trees up into this initiative by providing, let's say, a dedication or a small QR code on some trees. Let's say, for example, you were going to put uh, new street trees down Spring Street in Florence um, for you guys to be aware where those maps are so that you know any work that you're doing anyway in those spaces. We'd love to collaborate and partner with you. Um, and in cases where we can add to by providing the trees um, again, off the tree belt or in private property. For example, we're excited to work with Grow Food Northampton. We feel we could probably get, you know, 12 or 15 trees around the perimeters of those farm fields. Um, and those wouldn't be um, urban, they wouldn't be the city's property street trees, but nonetheless, they would contribute to this 
urban forest canopy and be part of this memorial project. So um, I think that's what I've got. Oh yes, here's a close up of this of the map. Again, I'm up in Williamsburg, so apologies, I don't have these all built for the Northampton section yet, but I'll be working with you all to think about. These red dots are um, imagination, right? They're not um, officially established spots, but just to give you the concept, the blue here, of course, is Mill River, the black line is Route 9, and then we're kind of imagining where we might be able to fit trees into the urban landscape here in Williamsburg. And we'd hope to generate a similar map in partnership with you all for uh, Northampton. So um, I believe, yes, that's it. I don't have a tree speak label for you. So I will um, get out of this and stop my share. Um, the reason I had given myself that note was just to say, um, we do have intention that each tree would have a very small plaque and by small, I mean, you know, uh, two by three inch, um, something just hanging, which would give you a QR code, which would send you to that website to give you more information. So we don't want to clutter the trees up with signage, but we do want some way that you could see the name of the person and then a way to learn more about that person if you are interested. So um, thank you for listening. I would love any questions or concerns that you guys have. My main intention with coming was just to so you guys could see this in the forecast and that we'd love to partner with you in any way that it feels synergistic with um, the work you're doing on the Urban Forestry Commission. Go ahead, Jen. Um, so if we, um, if we are gonna, like I know we're gonna be probably, hopefully if the weather holds, we're gonna be planting some more trees down in Florence Fields where they died already in the swale. Mm -hmm. um, like, would that be something you could account for? Yeah, it sure would. I think so, the, the sort of official kickoff is we're going to plant the first tree on May 18th, probably on the church grounds at Williamsburg uh, Congregational Church on North Main. So that will be the like official first tree. And we'll have some sort of brochure that we can hand out if folks want to make a donation or those kinds of things. But I think in terms of the accounting, um, we might, yes, I think we can sort of backdate it in a way, right? No so uh, it might even be, and we can talk about this, it's, I'm, I'm extemporizing here, but there might even be some, some younger trees that are already planted that we wanna um, back dedicate um, as part of this campaign. But on the other hand, this is also an opportunity to provide a net new 139 trees. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I don't want to backfill too much with existing trees because I think we actually have the opportunity to add to the canopy um, in this way that I think will really, my, I'm, I'm uh, perhaps biased since this is my idea, but I do think that this will inspire folks to make donations and um, get involved and uh, and so to the extent that that is adding to a constituency for the urban forest, I think, um, you know, there's I think there's a lot of synergy, again, with thinking about the flood, what's the history of this, but also what's the present day impact of these stories. So um, I think we have a compelling story to tell about the value of these trees um, beyond their their memorial power. Yeah. Hi, Molly. Uh, hi. Hi, Gabby. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is, do you already have a map um, in Northampton that shows the, the flood zone? Yes, we have the flood zone, but it doesn't have any red dots on it because I wouldn't yeah. presume to tell you all where to plant your trees. But right. yes, we do have the flood zone maps are all created and um, eas easily shared. I'd love to see, I'm, I'm sure we would all love to see that because yep. that'll figure out where would be places to put the trees. Yep, um, for sure. Another question I have, so who would actually be doing the planting and um, is there funding for like um, if you need uh, CU soil or, you know, soil improvement for the trees, would that be included too? So the, my intention is to do private fundraising. We did a, apply to the Williamsburg and Northampton Cultural Councils for the May 18th and that might sort of pay for the first tree or something like that. But um, my plan is to launch a fundraising campaign through the Mill River Greenway uh, C3 and invite people to make a $150 donation. 
in honor of the 150th anniversary and thinking that 150 kind of endows a tree in a way, not endows actually rich, that's probably the wrong word, but um, you know, furnishes the tree. I'm mostly expecting volunteer labor for planting. And I think that will spin up in different ways in the two towns. So I'd love to collaborate with you all and the, the trees Northampton and those kinds of things about the labor. Um, I'm a landscaper myself. I can certainly dig a hole and tickle a root ball with the best of them. But, um, you know, 139 trees, it'd be great to have it be a community effort. Um, I was, I'm not contemplating raising funds for engineered soils or um, things that you might need in the, in the more urban settings, in the tree pit context. You know, we'll be in in green space and tree belt in, in many of the locations. But, you know, I love to take them on on a case by case basis. And certainly any funds we raise for this project, I'm happy to deploy in a mutually um, smart way. You know, if we can leverage city funds where we can, but, you know, leverage volunteer or private donations where we can. I think if we just hold hands about it, um, and, you know, we're figuring out, is this one going in the tree belt? Therefore, can we access certain pockets of money that you guys have or not? Um, I think we can do those literally one at a time. My, I sort of set a rough goal of trying to get them planted over five years. Um, maybe it'll go faster than that, but um, I don't feel like I'm in a hurry. I'm just sort of setting that as an intention. So, um, yeah, Susan. Muted. Following up on what Molly, Molly asked about the map, like I was trying to zoom in on the map, but I couldn't really see. You mentioned right. Spring Street, for example. Um, what The best opportunities on that street really are the setbacks. You could have incredibly nice trees. I don't know if you're familiar with that program. Yeah. But yep. Um, whether it be, you know, not necessarily city funded setbacks, like we usually use the term, but maybe specific to this project, you could you know have people host them on their property because the tree but there's not a lot of tree belt like where a good tree can live so yep. getting them on private property is really fantastic whether it be yep. through official setback or just getting the trees on yards i would think would be so exciting yeah i what i i can um if you if you all know South Main Street in Haydenville, if you've ever come up River Road from Leeds into Haydenville, um, we will be doing an outreach to that neighborhood and just saying, anybody want a tree? Um, we've got free trees and, you know, we're happy to come out and talk to you and figure out if a dogwood's appropriate or you, you can host a sugar maple. And, you know, there's no species um, constraints on this. Um, I think it's just, you know, trees that are appropriate for any given site. So we're hoping that people will be glad to adopt a tree, um, you know, for if if um, it doesn't cost them anything. And then maybe that also becomes a care program. If it's in your front yard, maybe we can count on you to water it for the first couple of years and, and that sort of thing. Gabby. A quick question. Uh, have you given any thought to uh, planting like a grove of trees uh, yes. in relation to where there probably was a larger loss of life, like the yep. like in the in the areas where there were uh, more houses destroyed? I, I'm just curious if you've identified on that map, and I don't think we talked about this when we met, have identified any locations that might be on city property that might be able to support a grove of trees that would commemorate like, like the five folks that died in that one family, for example. Right. Yeah. Um, I think there's going to be opportunities for that. So as I said, I haven't really gone kind of parcel by parcel on the Northampton end, thinking that was something to do collaboratively with y'all. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in Williamsburg, I'm more involved parcel by parcel because of all of our planning for the Greenway, which is very close to groundbreaking at this point. And, you know, if it, so so uh, my my knowledge of where they might go in Williamsburg is more refined, but I think, you know, you and me and a map and a Sharpie, Rich, we could have a really good time um, look, uh, identifying those <laughs> opportunities. And um, and yes, I, 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 we do have an intention around clusters or groves where they fit. 
Um, so I'd be excited to work with you guys about where some of those places might be. Okay. I, I, and I really, I really think this would be great. Um, I, I also would like to challenge you um, to uh, instead of planting one tree on Saturday, May 18th, we should be planting all of the trees. <laughs> now, the only reason I'm saying that is because if we had one large order of bare root trees, it, it, the, the issue is not we could get the trees. The issue is all the legwork and identifying the locations. Yeah. But how incredible would that be to actually plant them all in one day? Um, it's, with, I know. like the idea. Um, I'll tell you, and really, I'm, I appreciate it. First of all, I love, I love the challenge. Thanks for the <laughs> boost of enthusiasm. That's excellent. Um, in Williamsburg, just to, to put a practical matter on it, the Greenway construction is going to be rolling out over over the next several years, and so I, I do have a strategic reason for waiting for some of the destruction to happen, and then coming back in with all of this, you know, beautiful wealth of urban forests. Yeah, as, as part of the reconstruction, but I, I'd be excited to look at Northampton. I mean, this winter, Rich, let's let's have our maps and Sharpies date and um, maybe identify some of those sites. Because I do think if there was a place where bare root could be, you know, I'm, I have Smith College mind where you need to get two or three inch caliper before it's safe to put them out in the world. Um, but if, if we can find some locations where saplings or even this uh, Miyawaki forest idea, you know, maybe this is a way to plant a whole little forest, uh, at least at least in that area of um, Florence Fields and grow food. We've got so much open space there. I think there's, and it's a, it's a very profoundly important place where this is where the most of the debris from the flood ended, you know, so, so it really was the final resting place for many of the folks that lost their lives and um, so I think that's maybe there's a maybe there's a real opportunity to install a small urban forest at Grow Food sometime next spring. I'm totally game for us to have that happen as part of the commemorative event. So maybe we can meet in in the middle between one and one thirty nine. The bare roots are wonderful if you ha even if you had a smaller load because they're so much more economical. Yeah, and they take so well. Yes. Yep, they do. And uh, that that's what I would, I mean, we, we planted, we've been planting 30 every spring with uh, the vol volunteers the last two springs from uh, like the Northampton Rotary Club, you know, in, in different places. And it's just really very economical. Um, but those are places that there's a large area to plant. So it makes life a little easier. But yes, I, I definitely think as far as I'm speaking just for myself, but I can speak for the commission. I think we'd love to collaborate with you to try to to try to get this all um to, to get this up and running and whatever support you would need from us and again i'm speaking for myself but also for the commission please don't hesitate to reach out to us for anything great we're always looking yeah. for a good project am, am i am I, folks we're always looking for a good project everyone's just got to <laughs> like nod their heads yeah all right <laughs> got some uh, thumbs up uh J jackie have your hand up jackie yeah i just had an idea for if you really wanted to plant them all in one day maybe david could talk to the kids at the high school and you could get the high school environmental club teenagers have a lot of strength and energy plus mm -hmm. plus the history department could bring in some teenagers just a thought yeah yeah no thanks i love it yeah well um you know, Rich, we'll follow up. Let's follow up for the next couple months, you know, before you guys put in your bare root orders. Um, I, I certainly could imagine us organizing an event, a, a one day event in one location in Northampton, whether it's at Grow Food Northampton or some other smart place that we all agree. Mains Field. I mean, there's there's plenty of, you know, public infrastructure, green space that that could could be part of this. Um, and uh, and maybe making it part of that weekend um, that that seems like a great great idea and it would sort of kick off the Northampton aspect of of planting the the Northampton cohort of these of these memorial trees. Yeah, yeah, so. it'd be it'd be kind of interesting, Molly. Just one second, hold on. It'd be interesting to actually plant start off planting in Williamsburg and then actually start off the same day and plant somewhere at the very end, and mm -hmm. then we're sort of like connecting the two communities together. I don't know. That's just, yeah. Yeah. that would be very. Um, that's beautiful. 
Yeah, it'd be really the railroads. Yeah. So um, and then I think Molly is going to mention that we have a survey of leads, maybe, maybe not, that has planting location setbacks. So go ahead, Molly. That's not what I was going to mention, but it's <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, no, what I was going to ask is um, I assume that you're going that the map uh, that shows the flooded area goes along the former bed of the river through the center of the city, not like where the river is now. Yes. Like, so along that bike path. Um, yes. That is it. What is that? Is that Mainsfield? The one that's like um, behind Route 66. Um, that one where the, the roller skate park is the skateboard park. Oh, yeah. Veterans Field. Veterans Field. Field. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it goes, yes it that's used right. To go, didn't the river used to go right through that park? Yes, we, we call that the hidden mill back there, right, where the, the former path of the Mill River and there's some still some sort of kettle ponds out behind uh, br the brewery along the bike path there. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the old bed of the river, that's right. That would be an interesting place to put trees and, and along that section of the bike path because a lot of people don't know that that was actually the the uh, bed of the river before. Yeah. So it'd be combined with some, inf you know, education about, about that. Right. Yeah. Great. Yes. Yeah. So you'll see. So, so yes is the answer. We have it on the old, old flood bed. Um, the, by the way, just for the map nerds out there, it's pretty much done with contour lines um, is how, right. Mm -hmm. Cause there's no records of the flood went to exactly this spot. Um, but so we use the contour lines to roughly sketch in where the assumption is. And because all the debris washed out at Grove Food Northampton at Florence Fields, it's mostly just the water column and it would have been high water going through the old riverbed. It's not that it was out, you know, two city blocks in either direction the way mm -hmm. it was in the upper part of the flood. Because mm -hmm. um, all the debris was out of it. And it was just the the water that washed through. But there was, I, Betty's got some records, I think a bridge, maybe a South Street, South Street bridge, or one of the bridges in Northampton was taken out uh, mm -hmm. by the, by how much water there was. So, um, but yes, on the, on the old bed. Um, these are great. These are great thoughts. I appreciate all this, uh, you know, group think it only makes the project so much better. So glad to have you all involved. I know we, Steria Hearst Museum used to have a lot of records because the Skinners were yeah. moved after the flood, they moved to Holyoke, and there, there's a there's a lot of papers there at that museum that used to be their house. Yeah, and people used to people came from Boston, like there was a big market in images of disasters, and so a lot of people would come, and mm. you know, there should be a lot of images of it. Yep. Um, yeah, historic Northampton has a pretty deep archive, and and Good. they even right. have um, some artifacts. Um, for example, there's an old boot that is mm. was was washed up from the flood. Some pretty vivid um, mm. examples of of things. So, um, but yeah, so, no, you're you're right. Wisteria Hearst is. Yeah. I mean, we should just I should just let them know also that we're doing this and see mm. where those those synergies. Yeah. I think that's great. That's a great great yeah, idea. Maybe yeah, maybe they might be a great source of um of money. Yeah, that's true. Maybe they want to contribute to some memorial trees. Absolutely. Wonderful. So trees are a big part of this, and that's so wonderful to hear. Thank you so much, Gabby. Yeah, thanks for all this time. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I think if you if we all have a shared map in our minds, you know, to your point about me sharing the flood extent maps with you, you guys will just kind of have a tickler that anytime you're doing anything in that area, you know, give me a holler and we'll figure out how we can collaborate. I think that'll work really great as a process going forward. Great. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. All right. Thanks, y'all. Much obliged. I'm sure I'll Thank see you, you again you. soon. Bye-bye. Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll be in touch. Great. Thanks, Rich. You're welcome. Um, that that that's uh that's an awesome. That's awesome. I promise in the spring I I I will be at a planting this fall at some point. I promise. I just I'm almost done with all the extracurricular stuff. So <laughs> um, but that really is a very um amazing. It's it's an amazing project. I mean, we're really fortunate. You know, we have like 50 uh 50 tree canopy coverage, and we're still like finding places. It's actually more than that. It's I think, and Kent can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's 57 or 56 percent canopy coverage. 
and we're still finding places to plant trees. And there's another project that we're actually going to partner with a potentially um, another community or a third party to get trees planted in commemoration of uh, shared historical um, a shared historical event between the two communities. So it's really kind of a very, very cool. We, we really seem to always find something new to do, uh, which is wonderful. And uh, so if you're okay, if you are okay, um, I will have a conversation with Gabby uh, offline about this and potentially if um, Gabby feels that it might be useful, maybe we would have another commissioner also um, be involved with the conversation just so we can have um, a smooth process in case like for example I have to go somewhere or you know I think it's better the more eyes the more eyes and hoping the better so but I'll, I'll I'll get back to you on that so um okay fall planting update um Jen and Sue I'm putting you on the spot because I only know I delivered That's the, the driver. Jen's in the driver's seat. <laughs> Go ahead, Sue. Do you want to? You want to start? I don't. I don't have any numbers or anything. Oh, um, me neither. Handy, but um, um, we're making a lot of headway towards our goal, which the main goal was the trees that kind of got backlogged in the lot because of the pandemic and the hot weather and the droughts and things that were preventing us from full planting seasons. Um, we, we really want to utilize all of those trees and Jen, we're close, right? We're pretty close. Uh, I don't, I should have, uh, I forget that, uh, like that's my, I need to have all this ready for a meeting. I got a lot of balls in the air. I forget. I'm like, Oh, I got to do that one too. Um, yeah, we're doing uh we're doing pretty good. I don't I don't have the number I'm terrible remembering remembering numbers. Oh, but I'm sorry. The last one was fifty. We're probably I think we only had like thirty trees left in the in the yeah. nursery. I mean that we don't have spaces for. And we just um I just did a walk around with Rich at Bridge Street Cemetery and we uh cited twenty two trees. We haven't planted those yet, but if the weather cooperates, we should, you know, really have um, emptied out. And I think it was 156 or 136 trees or something. Yeah. Originally. And we are having a few more delivered. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Some spots. That's right. Right. <laughs> but right. Um, it's, there are a lot of steps involved. Each tree planting when, you know, the volunteers show up and we do it. Behind that, every single tree, there's just so many hours of and steps involved in it um so jen's been doing an awful lot and others have helped as well but we're we're making a lot of headway so we'll probably end up with 125 or so this season i'd say that's realistic maybe a few more depending on how we luck, lucky we are with the weather and volunteers yeah. you know how many and yeah and it's i mean we have had those big years where we planted enormous numbers of trees you know 200 trees or more in a season, but considering the, you know, losses we've had with the volunteer time of Rob and Jen, and also as we go along, we've done the low hanging fruit. So mm -hmm. we end up with, okay, a tree here, maybe a tricky spot, a busy road, and then another tree over there and another tree over there. It's not as easy to organize when you, when you have things spread out like that. Mm -hmm. so um but we have That's some really fun ones coming up we're gonna do um some bridge street cemetery trees mm -hmm. some florence field trees which will be a lot more relaxing than some of the sites we've been on mm -hmm. yeah well we have to you know we're plugging trees in here and there um from various lists from stuff that got left uh from rob and alicia and then also uh you know because of the drought a couple of years ago uh rich parish headed up pulling out a lot of trees and we've plugged almost all those back in um and then i we're working on a uh takedown list and a stump grinding list from rich 
So, you know, none of those are all on the same street. So it, it's a little slower because, you know, we're not in one, one street and, you know, booming them all in. But I, I feel really good about what we've done. We've had steady volunteers and, um, you know, we've had kind of a couple rainy weekends, which didn't really help us, but, um, I, I feel pretty good about what we're doing and, uh, we can evaluate, uh, at the, at, you know, once we stop planting and see what we did well and what we need help with. And, um, yeah. So, and, you know, you run into weird things like today there was a site I had the, there was a gas line there. So we, I negotiated with the homeowner, we moved it over and then there was asphalt, you know, six inches down. So we could, couldn't put the tree in, you know, and you know, it's urban, you know, we're urban planting. So anything could happen, you know? So, uh, it's but, almost the exception when everything is really straightforward yeah. <laughs> from like right. the roots of the tree to mm -hmm. everything involved along the way. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot. And, and, and certainly when it's a setback and you have, you know, you have all that, you have to communicate with the people and have them have a good experience. It's not just about getting the job done. It's, right. it's also taking the time to listen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I think we're doing I think we're you know well on our way to our goal and uh I think we're we're doing pretty good so thanks Jen yeah thank thank you and I would I would tell you I went down to the nursery yesterday to uh turn the water off and winterize things and the nursery is it's the least amount of trees I've seen in there in a long time so um it's making a of course the leaves fell off too so that's another that makes it look uh, a little different, <laughs> but, uh, but I know they've been, I know that they are, we keep pulling trees out of there. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting the rest of the season in. Uh, hopefully we will be able to finish, you know, right before Thanksgiving or if the weather stays warmer and we have stock, it's great. Um, I did, uh, this is something a little separate from the fall, but it has to do with planting. I did meet with a, um, two residents that are uh, part of the HOA on Ice Pond Drive uh, on, uh, uh, let's see, yesterday, Tuesday morning. Um, there are like 12 uh, green ash trees there that are either virtually dead or just about, you know, they have less than 10% of their live crown ratio left. And um, I like to plug in that location for a spring planting. Um, so I'm going to be, uh, I talked to Jen, I talked to Sue about it a little bit, but I'm going to send in craft an email and send it to the HOA because I think the way that we're going to approach that, um, at least this is my early initial thinking is that we are probably going to take all the ashes down and then grind all the stumps. And we're going to start from the beginning instead of trying to plug in trees underneath existing ash canopy, like we've done in the past. Mm. Um, and the HOA uh, folks uh, are interested in volunteering, at least the ones that I talked to. So, but hopefully we might be able to use, uh, you know, our bare root planting stock and our method there, maybe be part of our spring uh, Earth Day, Arbor Day planting. So, so there are, there are a few places like that. There's Ridgeview, Ridgeview Road is another location that has a lot of ash trees, Um they're not all planted in one like block where there's six on either side of the street, but um, in the other places, Village Hill, um, which has a lot of ash trees that are uh, especially on um, Moser, Moser Street on the yeah. going towards uh, like the dog, the uh, dog park community mm -hmm. gardens. They're all ashes in there. So we will probably have to look at that, that as well and have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Um that particular HOA that's in that one area. So, um, but anyway, so there's definitely places to plant in mass still. It's just, again. The, the resources to get all those trees cut down and get all those stumps grinded in time for Earth Day? Yes. Oh, that would be wonderful because we start planting Earth Day in January. So yep. tick-tock. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All of a yeah. sudden it's going to, November, December just it's not, it's not it's not going to snow this winter I, I, I forgot to mention that oh yeah awesome we're gonna we're gonna be planting until january no, no frozen no frozen root balls either oh no, no nothing it's going to be beautiful oh. today was just a little blip on the radar we're all oh, okay. snow, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is it 
Yeah. Yes, Molly. Quick question. Those ash trees on Ice Pond Road, are they dying because of emerald ash borer? Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah, they're dying. The, so yeah. that it's already here. It's oh. attacking. And oh, yeah. Trees. Yeah. We're, we're also going to have another location on Armory Street that are pre-existing green ashes that have been there. They've been there for as long as I've worked here. Yeah. And you can see how large they are. They're not very large mm -hmm. <laughs> because of the because of their soil volume. But we are going to have to take down the majority of those as well. And some actually going into the uh, Armory Street parking lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so there'll be other places to plant there. Mm -hmm. So that'll be happening. The Some of the removals will happen in mid-November. And I'm going to try to have the ice pond, um, the ice pond trees removed as well. I just have to get that get them their email so they can understand what's happening so they can spread the word to the residents and then also notify the mayor's office in case there's an issue with someone complaining about a large amount of trees being removed and maybe not necessarily knowing why um and then um getting the stumps on army street the stumps have to be pulled out on ice pond drive they can be ground and then we can just plant in between them or mm. close to them um but just a just a quick update, and again, I'll be working with Sue and Jen offline um, to make those arrangements happen. Um, and that's yes. I just wanted Molly. They're not even like recommending the 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 any kind of controls anymore or pre, you know, do something pre invasion. They just they. The emerald ash borer insect has a real just flies far, and yeah. that's that's a big difference between like uh, Asian longhorn beetle and emerald ash borer, and it's pretty much like mm. if it, you know you wait to see if they are stricken and then take them down, and maybe there'll be a few that are resistant somewhere, but mm. um, yeah, that's it's just that's they're the all solution. doomed. Yeah, yeah, that's the they're solution all right now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. It sounds like the um homeowners association has some understanding of emerald ash borer. That's correct, right? Yes. So yeah. Our, seeing the, what's going on and that there's a reason. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I and I talked to these two residents yesterday. And I talked to a third one when I went and inspected them a couple of weeks ago or in September. Um, and everyone that lives that abuts where these trees are is on board with getting them removed because. They're at the point now that they're failing, so branches are falling out of them. So you know, I they have to be taken down um, soon. So that that would be my goal. Um, it's going to be traumatic, though, still to have a street lose all their trees. Well, it it is, and again, this is a really good example. And I'm going to take pictures, you know, before and after pictures of why you don't plant a monoculture. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and I still see it happening, unfortunately. I, I, but that's another story for another day. But definitely, uh, and those were all planted under the old planning board rules and regulations when they had just a single sheet of uh, recommended street trees uh. that was based on. I, I don't really know what it was based on. I, there was no documentation where it came from. I think it was just made up. And I'm, now we're all using um, our tree list and planting guidelines. So which is which is great any other questions about fall planting i'm glad i left 20 minutes at the end to talk about stuff that's not anticipated because we run over uh and if marilyn was here i would be she would be ringing the bell on me so um i always think of marilyn whenever i'm running late now so <laughs> marilyn's always in my, talking to me <laughs> um so spotter lantern fly update. I, I left this, I put this on here because I just, I have the final draft of the letter. I'm going to stick it on the letterhead and I'm going to send it back to you all to review. My apologies. I was supposed to do this earlier, but I wanted you to take a look at it before it gets sent to the mayor's office. So I thought we already did that. I did not I did not send it on the letterhead. I want you to see how it looks because the right. issue uh with the letterhead is, and again, that's, that is on me because I have been out of the office a lot, unfortunately. Um, but I just want you to see how it looks before we send it over there. And the other thing that I was thinking is that um, we obviously have to ask the mayor for the approval to send the letter out. 
But um, I would like to, I'm also going to ask the mayor's office, if they willing to post something on the city's website? Um, whether it's at least a little blurb about it, uh, maybe uh, in a link to MDAR or something, or maybe they publish the letter, um, you know, post the letter. So, but I will get that to you tomorrow. Um, and I don't have anything else in regards to that. Um, unless Molly, I don't know if you have any new updates. No, I didn't. Um, I didn't um, like send a press release to the Gazette or anything like that. I just, I don't know. I just haven't motivated myself to do that. Um, so yeah, I, I, maybe I, I think I'll do it. Well, I mean, I, you know, talking to my counterparts, they, no one seems to be, um, no one seems to be super concerned about the spotted lantern fly. And I think part of the reason yeah. it is, is, go ahead. There's nothing you can do really. Right. And and, <laughs> and and because it's categorized as a nuisance and not a threat, mm -hmm. uh, especially to trees, it's it's not um, it doesn't rise to the level of the other like Emerald Ash Borer, Asia Long. Yeah, um, that's kind of how I feel about it personally, too, that I just don't feel motivated to put a lot of energy into it because it's not really that much of a threat to our trees. It's somewhat of a threat, but more of a nuisance than anything else. So I, I'll get that. I'll send that to you tomorrow. So it's all um, right. It would be great if we could all like get that letter yep. as soon as possible to the mayor and out because yep. it's that season. It's already November. It's already November. Yep. It's and so basically you want late. now people you, you want people to find the egg masses if they can see them. This is a good time to see them because they're going to be on the sides of the, yeah. up the canopy or on the sides of the trunk or on other objects. Yeah. So. I don't know if the letter needs to be modified to emphasize looking for the egg masses now instead of like the adults. We I can look at it and see. Okay. All right. L let me, I'll send that off tomorrow morning. Um, okay. We have a, we have about 10 minutes. So any other business not anticipated by the chair? Jen kind of had her hand. Sure. Jen or Molly Jen. or. Jen, go ahead. No. No? no. Okay. Well, um, yeah, it wasn't me. No. Well, I just wanted to. Um, I spent some time before this meeting reading the or looking over the um, urban forestry plans of Cambridge and Boston, mm -hmm. and wow, they're so impressive. Um, and I'm wondering how do we approach this? Like, even discussing it here, um, how do we even find time to like? It's such a big project. The way the way that those two cities did it, it's like a huge, huge project with lots of collaboration and lots of different people working on it. Um, I'm not sure how we actually go about working on that in the context of our two meetings per month. That's a really good question. And um, I think that we are uh, we are fortunate in Northampton. We have sort of a different patchwork because we have such a robust sustainable plan that exists already that does mention trees. We also have a really robust volunteer organization to Northampton. We have a robust commission. We have a tree warden. We have a, you know, we have urban forestry uh, funding to maintain our canopy. Um, and, and I agree with you that the, 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 the question is, is, is I, as I wonder if, if we, I think what we I think what we should do is put our collective heads together and figure out exactly what we would like to see that we don't have already. And how do we go about actually getting that? You know, do we want uh, and is it something that, you know, and then I think once we figure out we'd like to do something, then we obviously have to send a letter to the mayor or meet with the mayor and ask the mayor if she would be willing to support um you know, an addendum to this urban, the Northampton sustainable plan that, in, that includes trees, or is it a standalone plan that talks about um, the city's urban canopy? I, you know, I don't know the answers to those questions. I think we need to look at this from the, uh, we need to figure out what we don't have. So we have, sort of have to back into it. Right. What, what, right. What, right. What, what don't we have that we think would, that we would like to have and then draw on those pieces in those in the in those two reports, or maybe there's some other ones we can find, and say, well, you know, we would like to have these five things. How do we go about getting them? 
Um, that's yeah. kind of how I kind of how I view it. I think maybe we could start out by. I mean, I'm I'm just thinking of like what's a tangible way that we can start to approach this as a commission. Maybe one way would be if people read those reports, or, or at least maybe not read the whole Boston one, which is really really wordy, but at least look through it um, and pick out what are some ideas from these things. Um, like you said, that we could that we would like to think about applying here. Mm -hmm. um, for example, like one of them is the whole thing about buy-in from private landowners, you know, because I see that as an obstacle. Like, how are people going to feel about us, like, telling them what they can do with their private trees? So how do we work on buy-in? Maybe there's some ideas we can get from those. But maybe what we could do is, like, all of us could read those and sort of make a list of ideas from those that we'd like to pursue, you know, that things that we're not already doing. Mm -hmm. I think that would be good. I also think um, not to be a pain, but it might be helpful for us to put a deadline for that. Mm -hmm. We actually know that we have to come to like, um, yes, exactly. Like our first meeting in January with, I'm using that as an example, our first meeting in January with, we've read them all. Uh, maybe we find a few, maybe we find a few others that are more uh, comparable um, population wise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we come to that meeting prepared with just like a, a cheat sheet of what we all came away with it and just have a just use the meeting for that discussion for everything, basically. Maybe we could even create a Google Doc um, of that we can put our ideas into. Yep. Yep. Just a, like a list of the ideas that yep. we each think of that could yep. come from those plans or from just our heads or anywhere. Yep. Okay. All right, I, I can make a go ahead. So, well, let's see on the Cambridge um, example, you have an 18 member task force with a paid lead person. They're holding two hour meetings over several years in different communi community locations. I think that's all about building up, Molly, the. Mm -hmm the conversation Fine. in the community to build the awareness of of how important trees are right and buy-in so it's and buy-in so i don't know you know without a paid person to leave and lead an 18 member task force from yeah. different you know they have the economic sector you know people from different sectors of the community mm -hmm. bought into this and then that reverberates out, presumably, to an acceptance in the community for such a project. I mean, it's a pretty big undertaking. And I don't know how that scales down to Northampton and what kind of leader. You need somebody to lead lead it. I was impressed in Boston. I, it was one of the first, on the first page, it said that they created a new forestry division within their parks and recreation department. And this forestry division now has 11 full-time staff. I'm like, oh my God, wow! With that, you could do anything. It, yeah, that, that's really interesting because at the class that I was in Holy Cross today, one of the instructors uh, asked anyone asked people in the polled people in the audience, "How many of you just work on urban trees?" And there was only about four hands that went up. So that is interesting in itself. It what dovetails exactly what you just said, Molly, is that. Most people um, that have a role like mine um, in most of the communities in Massachusetts are, you know, spread very thin and doing a lot of different things. And one of the 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 reason our our initiative has been so successful is because of the buy-in we've had, the great work by the commission of uh, the people that are here in this meeting, plus people of the past commissioners, Tree Northampton, two different administrations. Um, but it, that just kind of resonated with me about like, those are the kind of things that should be identified. You know, you need to, you may need to have a standalone person that does just forestry that may have to work for this particular person at the public works department versus having it housed in one person. Uh, you know, it's just one example. Um, but, um, but I definitely think that, um, if I guess I I can set a deadline if you want to. All right, we can wait till our next meeting. That's entirely up. I will leave that. You think about it, and maybe someone could email me their collective thoughts about that. Um, I like your starting point there. The idea that we 
all read this and possibly one more by January, the first January meeting. Is that okay. what you said? Yes. So that would be part of the goal. And then okay. was there another part that you said? Um, no, other than just actually come, you know, we, in the interim, we'll have a Google sheet. I'll, I'll make a Google document that people can actually put their thoughts on. Um, and then we can just sort of like hash things out, um, about what we've thought about or what we'd like to have, or what we already have and what we like to do, you know, things we do well, and maybe things we'd like to do better. And, you know, how do we quantify that and actually make that a sustainable initiative and what, you know, who do we have to, you know, what are the stakeholders we need? Um, if, you know, do, do we make our own separate standalone plan? We have a lot of good buy-in in this community already, but, you know, are there pockets of people we're missing? You know, there's a lot of questions to be asked. And I think we need to ask a lot of questions of ourselves and sort of reflect on the program that we are running or the initiative we're, we're running here and see if there's a better way of doing it. That's all. And, and actually making it sustainable. Hi, Kent. I just wanted to say I did find some examples of urban forest master plans from cities that maybe have less resources than Cambridge and Boston. Mm -hmm. I could send those out if that's interesting. It's, yeah. it's fantastic. Cool they're, they're less yeah. grand, like Burlington, Vermont has one. And um, I'll, I'll send the links to, I think I have four or five of them. Perfect. Thank Great. you Kent, for Great. doing our doing our homework, Ken. Thank you. Yes, thank you. What a resource you are. Stu. It's Jen. I'm sorry, sorry, Jen. Sorry. Yep. I'm in the wrong part um, of my screen. I just yeah. would suggest that somebody send out a periodic reminder or push that um you know this word. I mean, all my best intentions of, oh, yeah, I'm going to read those things and I'm going to, you know, I think it's helpful for me is if there's some just an email reminder, like at some interval that says, don't forget, you know, here's our timeline. We need people to be prepared. The Google Doc is here. You know what I mean? I mean, we're all well intentioned, but I think the meeting we discuss it will be much more productive if people are it's a way to hold people accountable i don't mean to be whatever but i just think i've seen better results in in other places in my life if those you know just little reminders go out you know and the key thing is resending the link because you may mm -hmm. think, oh, yeah, I'm going to yeah. work on that. And then you end up looking for the email with the Where's link. The link? Exactly. And then you see your cousin's yes. email and you get all these yes. distractions. Ah. Yes. Right. Right well, now, I'll just tell you the link to those two, the Cambridge and Boston, is in the minutes from the last, was it the last meeting in October or the one in September? I think it was a September one, actually. September one. I think what I'll do is um, when Kent sends the links out, I will actually create a master email with oh, all perfect. the links and a link to the Google sheet. Oh, that's great. And and then if, um, although if someone, if Marilyn was here, she'd be able to remind me when to send the emails out. So Marilyn's not, I could always <laughs> ask her to come back for a short period of time. Um, <laughs> but uh, I will, uh, I will do my best to remind myself and all of you that we need to make sure we just sort of stay on track and be prepared for that um prepared for that meeting so i could send out some reminders too okay well then, we'll, yeah. we'll we'll be in touch we're going to have a meeting um in another um uh, another uh, our next meeting normal meeting this month anyway so we can discuss that a little more if you'd like um and i also wanted to discuss but we're out of time uh i wanted to talk to you a little bit about a, a pds professional development series that is uh going to be um hosted by Mass Tree Wardens and Foresters in 2024 uh, at some date and time to be announced um, that is uh, going to be surrounding um, volunteer, uh, volunteer, maybe volunteer tree committees, volunteer tree, um, uh, uh, like Tree Northampton initiatives, things of that nature. So there might be a, there might be an opportunity for some of us to present um, at a PDS that would be, you know, have probably about 50, attendees potentially to talk about tree northampton 
Um, and we're looking to get a few other communities potentially. And I'll, I'll keep you posted at the next meeting because I'll know more in a, in a couple of weeks. But so I might need your like to have your assistance with that. So um, it's 602. We're a little over time. Anyone have any comments? <laughs> Anything else that, uh, any other business not anticipated by the chair? No, nah, none. Okay. Do uh, we have, uh, can someone make a motion to adjourn the meeting then? I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. All right. May we have a second? second. All right. We've hot second. We're ready to go. And uh, that is it. We don't need a roll call. So um, I will see you all in a couple of weeks.